I'd like to thank everyone who helped promote the auction for the Lame Horse Cowboy Ukulele. Congratulations to the winning bidder, Mr. Pat Gavin from Houston, Texas. Pat, I appreciate your support, and I hope you enjoy being the owner of this fine instrument. Once again, a very big thank you to Chris and Jeremy Jenkins with Lame Horse Instruments for donating one of their original cowboy ukuleles to help raise funds for this show. If you'd like to learn more about Chris and Jeremy and take a look at their beautiful handmade guitars and banjos, as well as the cowboy ukuleles, go visit their website, lamehorse.org. Today's show is all about Guy Clark. Guy Clark spent most of his career based out of Nashville, but he was born and raised in Texas, and he was always thought of as a Texas songwriter. I read that while he was growing up in Texas, his family would read poetry around the kitchen table every night. Some of the poets that were read were Robert Frost and Robert Service and Stephen Vincent Benet. I think you can clearly see the influence of that poetry on Guy Clark's songwriting. And I'd like to recite a Stephen Vincent Benet poem to kick off the show. I first heard these words recited by my friend Joel Nelson, so I can't recite this without thinking of Joel. This is The Ballad of William Sycamore by Stephen Vincent Benet. My father, he was a mountaineer. His fist was a knotty hammer. He was quick on his feet as a running deer, and he spoke with a Yankee stammer. My mother, she was merry and brave, and so she came to her labor with a tall green fur for her doctor grave and a stream for her comforting neighbor. And some are wrapped in a linen fine and some like a godling's scion, but I was cradled on twigs of pine in the skin of a mountain lion. And some remember a white starched lap and a ewer with silver handles, but I remember a coonskin cap and the smell of bayberry candles. The cabin logs with the bark still rough and my mother who laughed at trifles and the tall, lank visitors, brown as snuff, with their long, straight squirrel rifles. I can hear them dance like a foggy song through the deepest one of my slumbers, the fiddle squeaking the boots along and my father calling the numbers, the quick feet shaking the punching floor and the fiddle squealing and squealing till the dried herbs rattled above the door and the dust went up to the ceiling. There are children lucky from dawn till dusk, but never a child so lucky. For I cut my teeth on money musk in the bloody ground of Kentucky. When I grew as tall as the Indian corn, my father had little to lend me, but he gave me his great old powder horn and his woodsman's skill to befriend me. With a leather shirt to cover my back and a redskin nose to unravel each forest sign, I carried my pack as far as a scout could travel. Till I lost my boyhood and found my wife, a girl like a Salem clipper, a woman straight as a hunting knife, with eyes as bright as the dipper. We cleared our camp where the buffalo feed, unheard of streams were our flagons, and I sowed my sons like the apple seed on the trail of the western wagons. They were right tight boys, never sulky or slow, a fruitful, a goodly muster. The eldest died at the Alamo, and the youngest fell with Custer. The letter that told it burned my hand. Yet we smiled and said, so be it. But I could not live when they fenced the land, for it broke my heart to see it. I saddled a red, unbroken colt and rode him into the day there, and he threw me down like a thunderbolt 
and rolled on me as I lay there. The hunter's whistle hummed in my ear, and the city men tried to move me, and I died in my boots like a pioneer, the whole wide sky above me. Now I lie in the heart of the fat black soil, like the seed of a prairie thistle. It has washed my bones with honey and oil and picked them clean as a whistle. And my youth returns like the rains of spring and my sons like wild geese flying. And I lie and hear the meadow lark sing and have much content in my dying. Go, play with the towns you have built of blocks, those towns where you would have bound me. I sleep in my earth like a tired fox, and my buffalo have found me. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working cowboy west and beyond. My guest today is Noel McKay. Noel is a singer and a songwriter who performs solo and also as part of a duet with his partner, Brennan Lee. And both of them perform as part of the band High Plains Jamboree. Back in January, Noel was passing through Lubbock and playing a show at Amusement Park Recording Studios. And we sat down and recorded this interview. I'd like to thank my friend Scott Ferris for letting us use his space to record this. I asked Noel to tell me stories about his friendship with Guy Clark. Here's Noel McKay. I only knew of Guy Clark because I'd read that he was a big influence on Lyle Lovett. And Lyle Lovett, uh, at a certain point when I was in my early 20s, was a big influence on me. And um, somebody gave me a cassette tape of... um, one side was Pontiac, and the other side was Lyle Lovett and his large band. And I, that's that, that, those two records just flipped my lid. I just loved them. And so I had read that that Guy was a big influence on Lyle, and that was really just all that I knew of Guy. Uh, I had heard some of his songs covered by other people, but I didn't know it at the time. And... Uh, In 1993, I played the Jimmy Rogers Festival in Kerrville, Texas with my brother. And um, the headliners of that show were Guy Clark and Townsend's Van Zandt. And um, the curator of the festival's name is Kathleen Hudson. And uh, she... um, we were playing our set, and, and I saw her drag Guy by the arm and sit him down in the audience. And I remember thinking that that gig wasn't going very well. I remember thinking that the audience was not really particularly responsive to what we were doing. <laughs> and uh, But when we got through, uh, there was Guy. He came up to me and introduced himself, and he was just this really tall person had Lee press on nails on his right hand for playing guitar. I remember noticing that. And he said he really enjoyed what we did a lot. And he really liked a song that uh, one particular song, but several of the songs that, that I'd written. And he asked me to send everything that I had to him to his address. And he gave me a piece of paper that he, it was a, was an envelope that he'd ripped in half and wrote his address and his name and pencil on this envelope and handed it to me. <clears throat> And so I mailed all of the stuff that I had to him, but I also I bought a copy of Boats to Build, and I started listening to that. 
and uh, and then I bought Old Friends and listened to that, and then I bought Old Number One, and man, by that point, it just the gravity of what had happened with with somebody as well as as developed as and as literary a writer as guy the fact that he liked what i was doing began to sink in you know the gravity of that began to sink into me and so really that's how i got to know guy's music was after i met him and uh so i and so i got to know him and he uh really kind of you know became sort of a champion of 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 my songs and and always was introducing me to people and trying to get me in touch with people that he thought could help me out and um you know I had a young kid I had a I had a daughter that was that was born right around that same time and so I really wasn't able to go to Nashville and and pursue a songwriting career there like I I would have liked to, um, and I you know I guess guy understood that that was not really the kind of thing we really talked about a whole bunch but he always you know for example B Spears was Willie Nelson's bass player and played on a lot of guys' records and was an influential person in 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 the big the the big web of Texas music. In in the, you know, starting probably in the seventies, but on into the nineties when this was going on, and I remember, a guy called me and said, "Hey, my friend B Spears is playing over at the Saxon Pub. You should go hear him and go introduce yourself to him. He's expecting you. He's putting your name on the list." So I did. I went over there and I met B. I'd actually met B before when, when um, when guy was playing at Floors Country Store one time, and and I went to hear him and he dragged me backstage and made me play a bunch of my songs for all these different people that were hanging around back there and smoking cigarettes and whatever with Guy. And, uh, you know, that's another example of how Guy was just sort of trying to introduce what I do to people that he thought would appreciate it. And he continued to do that until till, till he died, you know, till the last... And, you know, to flash forward, Guy got sick, you know, and, and the last time I saw him was about, um, I guess, about a week and a half before he died. And he was in uh, hospice care. And uh, Brennan Lee and I went to see him. And uh, he was having a really good day and glad to see everybody and made us play a bunch of songs. And um, at one point, the phone was ringing. And he answered it, and it was somebody talking to him, and he put him on speaker. And they didn't want to let him go, and they were sort of dragging on about sust, whatever. But at a certain point, he said, Have you heard of Noel McKay and Brennan Lee? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, the, the, the last time I saw him, you know, he was, uh, he, was trying to, he was trying to get someone to sort of tune into what, what I was doing, and, you know, with Brennan in this case. Uh, you know that that was guy for you. He was he was very generous, and if he if he liked what you did, man, he was your champion for life. In March of 2012, my wife and I attended our one and only Guy Clark concert at Poor David's Pub in Dallas, Texas. The opening act that night was Brennan Lee and Noel McKay. I knew nothing about them before that show and was pretty anxious to see Guy Clark. But once they started playing, I was quite taken with their music, especially after they sang a song about vacationing in Lubbock. It was obvious that night that they were friends of Guy Clark's and that Guy was quite fond of them and their music. I'll tell you one story about that particular show. Well, let's see. We opened for Guy at Poor David's a few different times. I'll tell you a couple of different ones from two different shows. And that, probably the one you're talking about, since it wasn't the guitar string one, you don't remember that. I think you would remember this incident. That one, 
Guy and I had written a song called Flying and Falling, and it was kind of under construction, you know. It was one of those things where he thought that the editing kind of needed to take place a little bit, and so he would say, hey, well, maybe you should change this. And so I took it home, and I th- I, I wrote what I thought was probably the re- you know the final fixed version of it. But because I knew that, because I wanted to play it, particularly because we were opening for Guy, uh, I just took a chance and started playing the, the song, even though Guy hadn't really signed off on it. <laughs> but I tried to get it over with before he showed up, because he and Verlin went back to the hotel to, you know, and sometimes it took him a while to get back. So I decided I should play this song now before Guy gets back, maybe. So we played the song, and then all of a sudden I look up, and there's Guy leaning on his cane, scowling at me. <laughs> and, uh, and, I mean, he liked the song. So, you know, uh, he, he you know, I think that he thought it was, in fact, finished. But uh, I was still, you know, <laughs> I took a chance in doing that. But then the other poor David's date that I'm talking about, uh, you know, near the end of his career, he was performing and he would do this thing where he would wait until he got out on stage to tune his guitar, which is not the kind of thing that he did earlier in his career. I think he just kind of got, he was sick and he didn't feel good and he just didn't feel like doing that. So he waited and he forgot about it and he waited until he got out there to tune the guitar. And then all of a sudden the audience is yelling at him and then he gets confused and then he gets, you know, he was, then he got, you know, kind of, and he'd get kind of grumpy. So we're sitting backstage in the green room at, at poor David's and I grabbed his guitar and I tuned it for him. <laughs> and Berlin looked at me and he was like, gave me the thumb up. Yeah, like, you know, good. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> so so then they get out on stage and, the, and uh, you know, we'd played our set. They get out on stage and Guy's guitar's in tune. So smoothly, the show begins. It's off to a good start. Then, <laughs> at, I don't know, three or four songs in, the high E string slips off the post and and gets all slack and goes out of tune and falls off of there and so guy <laughs> guy's trying to fix it and he can't see it cuz he doesn't have his glasses cuz he left them backstage and he's asking somebody if they have a pair of pliers and they somebody has a pair of pliers and that shows up but then he still can't fix the thing with those pliers so then he gets his guitar in one hand and the cane in the other and he goes backstage and he looks at me like, you did this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he goes in the green room and I said, Guy, do you need help with that? And he doesn't, without a word, he shook his head. <laughs> so I felt real bad about it because I knew that, you know, like that that guy you know, thought maybe I'd done something to mess up the guitar. And in this point, Guy and I were building a guitar. I'm still working on it. I'll get to that in a bit. But I think, you know, because I'd made a couple of mistakes on that guitar, maybe he assumed... (laughs) The assumption was there, maybe, that I couldn't even tune the damn thing So without it going wrong. But Verlin Thompson, you know, nice, kind guy that he is, he'd like patted me on the shoulder and he goes, man, that wasn't your fault. That could have happened at any time. And that made me feel a little bit better about it. So then guy got his guitar fixed and back out there and it was fine. Throughout his career, Guy Clark was a champion of new young songwriters and often co-wrote songs with writers he admired. One of those young writers was Noel McKay. I asked Noel to talk about writing songs with Guy Clark and to discuss the co-writing process. That song, Flying and Falling, 
guy sent me home with some lyrics. He said, I'm having a hard time. I'm banging my head against this one. You take it home. You bring it back and see what you can do with it. And that always felt like a lot of pressure to me, but it also was a really great problem to have. And so I always, when I would get a guy idea that he wanted to share with me, that he entrusted me with, I always gave it my full, complete attention. And it became the focus for me until until I thought it was in a place to take back to him. And so in that for that song, I took it to him, and he said, I could tell he didn't like part of it. He said, well, do you like it? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. And he said, well, I tell you what, this part here kind of confuses me a little bit. Maybe you need, and he was always, you know, patient and not, I'm not always, but, you know, most of the time. He was patient about stuff, and he was he would you know he he was he he was tactful about how he asked me to change something, and so in this particular case, he said, "Well, this this is confusing me here. Maybe you need to clarify this." And so then I uh, I took it back. I and 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 then. Did what I think was, you know, a good spackle repair job on the lyrics and fixed the idea and made it a little more clear and took some things out that I thought weren't clear, you know. And uh, and somewhere in there I played it live, you know, a few times. And so when I got back to him, when I got it back to him, to his house, he made me play that song five different times and he recorded it five different times on five different guitars that he built. Now, why he did that, I don't know. Well, I actually do. I found out later. Uh, Verlin Thompson and I got together to try to write a song, and we drove to Verlin's sort of writing getaway place southwest of Nashville. And I was telling him that, that you know, why, you know, it was weird that guy made me play this song a bunch of times and record it. And he said, well, you know what? What he's doing is he's trying to learn that song. And that's great. That means he likes it enough to perform it. So, um, but he, you know, that was kind of getting near the end of the time where he was really making records. That was near the end of, uh, you know, like I guess he was kind of collecting songs from my favorite picture of you. And that just didn't end up being one of the ones that he cut for that record. But he did cut another one that we co wrote, which is El Coyote. And that one had a similar sort of writing process where he sent me home with the idea that was really the that was the second song that we wrote together the first one um i'll tell you about in a bit but el coyote um he gave me this he, he called me one day out of the blue and said he had a song idea for me and uh so when i got to his house he gave me the set of lyrics and he said Take this home and bring back, you know, think about how you want to do this and bring it back and we'll see what we what we can do from there. And man, oh, did I work hard on that thing. I just really poured my whole self into that idea and trying to make that whole thing, you know, believable and all that stuff and just like tried to make it, tried to make it feasible, tried to write about a really tough subject to write about. Uh, he he really saddled me with with what I think was quite a task, which is writing about human trafficking and uh, and 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 you know just kind of you know cultures, you know the the kind of clash of two different cultures in a way. And I don't know. I mean, it, it so I took it very seriously and. And when I brought it back to him, I was very nervous about playing that for him. And when when I got through playing that song, and I, I kind of waited a couple of seconds to see what he would say, and he said, good job, that's great, that's great. Uh, and then he kind of started pointing out a couple of different things that he thought should change, and we moved what what was just part of a verse 
Well, he he didn't like the chorus that I came up with, and I, he was right. It was a little bit too. Uh, it was too wordy, and it was uh, it kind of editorialized a little bit. And you you, I've learned from Guy, and maybe from some other people, but just your best approach to writing anything is to avoid editorializing. So we took the the original chorus out and threw it away and the one that that ended up being the chorus was just a little piece of a verse and we just extracted it from the verse and put it in the uh, in the as the chorus then at a certain point and guys started playing this song it shows and stuff you know he played it for me over the phone his like his cleaned up version and man it was cool to hear his voice singing that song over the phone and 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 I guess at that point it sunk in that I had really, you know, that 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 he really believed in that song a lot. And he did. He played that song for everybody at at his wake. Lots of people, lots of famous people that I didn't know or barely knew came up to me and said, "You know, guy loved you. He really loved you a lot, and he really loved that song that y'all wrote together. He played it for everybody." And they were talking about El Coyote. So at a certain point, I took it home. Uh, I'm sorry. At a certain point, a guy calls me again. I'm driving down the street in Austin. Guy gives me a call and he says, "Hey, I think we need another a, another half a verse at the end of that song." And I said, "Yeah, I agree with you. I've been thinking about that too." And he said, "I want you to think about Woody Guthrie and what Woody Guthrie would write for that." Now, that was kind of out of character for him to say something that specific. But I certainly was, you know, I was fairly familiar with Woody Guthrie's work. So I thought about that last half of that verse. I kind of climbed inside my own brain for days. Brennan will tell you that, that she, you know, when I get an idea that I can't let go of or, you know, something like that, that I'm sort of difficult to be around because I'm, just inside my own brain, and that was no exception. So I just thought about that last half of a verse for days and days until it, I really felt like it was right. And then I called him up and I said, okay, this is it. This is what I think it is. And uh, I played it for him. And he said, oh, that's too much like Woody Guthrie. You, <laughs> If you want to perform that, you can, but I can't. And, uh, but you know, I think, and and I do, and I, I still, I, I continue to perform, perform that song with that half a verse at the end, because I think it makes the song more concise. I think it ties up the song in a way that is necessary. Uh, I th- also think that it just had to do that guy's reaction to that had more to do with the mood that he was in that day than its proximity to. Woody Guthrie's work. In addition to being a master songwriter, Guy Clark built guitars in a workshop in the basement of his Nashville home. The word craftsman became attached to Guy Clark and was even the title to a 1995 collection of his songs. Though it seems that Guy was not fond of the craftsmanship idea being applied to his songwriting, The theme stuck. And it's hard to think of Guy Clark now without picturing him at his workbench. Noel McKay not only wrote songs with Guy Clark, but also sought out his help to build a guitar. Guy had these guitars laying around that he'd built. And... um, He'd built a bunch of them that he'd given away. I'd heard that. But at a certain point, well, to backtrack, I worked at Collings Guitars for a year. And I've always had something of an interest in in building guitars. So I asked him about building a guitar one day. I said, hey, you know, would you be willing to, to help me build a guitar? And he said, yeah, sure, man. So 
I got some material from Steve McCreary, who's the general manager of Collings. He gave me some some uh, rosewood and and a piece of spruce for the top, and I took it back to him. And um, he he wanted to kind of use a kit from from a, a website that that specializes in guitar building, and he. he but I I couldn't afford to do it. I couldn't I couldn't swing the kit, you know. So I just used the material that I had. And at a certain point, we took all this stuff over to his friend's house, who lived uh, not very far from him. This master luthier named uh, Paul McGill. And Guy, of course, is is a, is you know Guy was a master at that stuff too, but. What he did was one-off stuff. He didn't do that for a living, so he had the luxury of taking his time and really focusing on some very specific details that this guy, Paul, who did, who did it for a living and didn't have the luxury of doing. So we took... and but But on the other hand, Paul had some equipment that Guy didn't have, most specifically a planer that, that he'd made himself, and it was... V- it was it was ingenious so we took my stuff took my rosewood back and sides and my my sitka spruce top to this guy to get planed down and we planed down the back and the sides and he looked at my my spruce top and he said ah, i don't think there's enough here to build a triple o which is the the style that guy liked to build And so he just hands me this piece of wood. It's it's a piece of German spruce. And he said, here, build your guitar out of this. It's the same batch of spruce that Guy built his number 10 guitar out of. And Guy's number 10 guitar is the best sounding guitar I have ever played in my entire life. So I was beside myself <laughs> that I had gotten this piece of wood to build this guitar out of, you know, and I still have the spruce top that I got from Collings at the top of the closet at my house in Austin. And I, I'll build, I'm, I plan on building a smaller guitar out of that someday, but I'm, I believe Paul, when he says that there's not enough good wood in that thing to build a larger guitar, like a triple O. So, um, guy and I got that stuff back to the house and we started working on that guitar and I bent the sides and did the the bracing and stuff and guy helped me oversaw the whole thing and I got I glued the braces in to the back and you know and got glued glued the braces into the top and all that stuff you know and actually that's not right uh let's see we got the top cut out i got the top cut out right and and uh, drilled found found the center hole for the sound hole and cut used guys dremel tool and cut the rosette out and it went perfectly you know i'd made a couple of mistakes and so this thing just went perfectly and guy was really excited about the how how quick it was going and how it was coming together i could tell he was really excited about this guitar and so guy um uh, Helped me when it was time to cut out the sound hole, which was the next thing, you know, had the anchor hole cut and all that stuff. And uh, so somewhere in there, the little thing to tighten down uh, the jig for the Dremel tool to cut the sound hole out didn't get tightened all the way down. And it started, as I was cutting it, I could see that it started to drift and I cut, I turned the Dremel off and I showed Guy... And he sat there smoking his cigarette and he looked at it and he went, hmm, well, I don't know, man. And he said, I think maybe you need to start over on the, on the top. And I said, there's no way that I'm starting over on this top. There's no way that I'm not going to use this unless it just got cut all the way through and ruined. There's no way I'm starting over. And so I stuck to it. And what I did was I took a little, little emery board sort of file that Guy had, 
And I just widened the sound hole by about an eighth of an inch. And so, you know, it's not cosmetically perfect, but it's, it's, you would probably, unless you knew in advance, you probably wouldn't know. Unless you, unless you built guitars, you probably wouldn't notice. So, about that time, guys started getting sicker. And uh, he was having troubles with his hips, and he needed his knees replaced, and he had he had diabetes, and his uh, his toe. He had a problem with his toe. It got infected, and and uh, he uh, he had a, he had trouble with that toe. And one day I went over to his house and I said, "Hey, guy, how's your toe? Is it any better?" And he said, "Toe's gone, man." And I said, "What?" He said, "They cut the toe off." And so Terry Allen, you know, who's from here in Lubbock, yeah. had uh, had taken a pair of guy's boots and painted the missing toes onto <laughs> onto the outside of his boots, <laughs> on one of his boots, the one where his, where his toes were gone. <clears throat> so guy was having a hard time standing up. And if I would make a mistake or if he needed to show something to me, he would stand up, but he was getting sufficiently weak that when he would stand up, that meant that our workday was over and he would probably need to go upstairs and take a nap. So I started trying to sort of manipulate the situation a little bit so that we could work. And one of the things that I did was Guy had this table that he would write. where Guy had this table at which he would write songs. He would have people come downstairs and he had his little ashtray with all the skulls around it and he would sit and smoke. And uh, and write his songs on that table, and, and I just and the table had wheels on it. You could roll it around. So I I moved the table over and I I carefully pushed all that stuff over to one side and I made a a little working situation for our for 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 our guitar tool stuff. I made a little working situation for the guitar stuff. And guy was able to sit down, and we got a lot, a lot more done that way. And I got the, the body glued together. I started working on the neck, on the diamond of the neck, and pretty quickly, guy was too sick to even sit down and work. He was getting sicker, and I was on the road a lot too going to Europe, going on tour around the United States, etc. So I was I was around less and less, you know, I was I was not around enough to really get a lot done on days when guy was feeling good. And uh sometimes I would call and say, "Hey, can you can I come over? Maybe we can work on the guitar or I can just sit around and hang out and it ended up where we 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 just sat around talking, which was fine. And the main purpose of the guitar and building the guitar in the first place was really just to spend time with Guy anyway. And um I could it became evident to me that we weren't gonna be able to finish the guitar before Guy passed away. And I just had to accept that. So, a few days, the day before Guy's wake, I went over to Guy's house and had to do some begging and pleading, but I got my guitar back from Guy's caretaker slash girlfriend. We'd flown there. We'd played a few shows, played Mountain Stage in West Virginia and, and stuff, and went to Guy's funeral, and I had to go. I had my my Collings guitar in my in my Col- Colton flight case, and uh, what I did was I went to a music store in Nashville and I bought a bag, and I put my Collings in the bag, and I put that guitar that I'd started with Guy in that heavy duty flight case, and and flew home with both instruments, and that guitar sat around my house for months 
because every time I would get it out and look at it, I would just get so sad thinking about how much I missed the guy. And, uh, you know, because he was just such a good friend and and really just, it was very, it, it was difficult to lose somebody that just genuinely believed in me a lot. And, uh, but I guess about three weeks ago, I just said, forget it. I got to get back on this. And so I got the guitar out and, uh, ordered some stuff in the mail that it was missing. And some, there were some things that were still over at guy's house that I just wasn't able to get away from his house from, from downstairs in his shop. So I just had to order them. And, uh, I, uh, started working on it by myself, you know, uh, and last night and the night before I glued the binding in and I glued the purfling into the back and the next step I got to glue, I've got to wait for something to come in the mail, a little strip of wood to fill in the channel for the, for the purfling on the top. But I started carving on that neck again and, uh, the my main the main thing that would kicked me in the butt and got me got me in that place where I really knew that I had to start working on that guitar again is that on April seventh this year twenty seventeen at the Paramount Theater in Austin they're putting on a big Guy Clark tribute and Terry Allen's going to be there and Sean Camp is going to be there and Verlin Thompson's going to be there and Jack Ingram and Brennan Lee and you know some other folks that I really look up to and. uh I really want to have that guitar finished by that show because I'm on that show too. So um, this is that song that I wrote with Guy that, uh, that I sprung on an audience without getting Guy to sign off on it, but he finally did. And um, we, we wrote this after Guy had an accident working on his mailbox one time and he ended up in the emergency room he was all bunked up and uh it, it was bad you know he, he ended up in the hospital for a few days and he was so mad about that whole thing just that that happened <laughs> so we wrote this but then you know since guy passed away since i watched him get sick and I, and he fought and fought to to get well and he just wanted to get better more than anything else and get back out on the road and write songs that he believed in. And, and I've just never seen anyone with such such a will to live, you know, and such such a just sort of a lust for life as Guy Clark had, you know. So I realize now that this song that we wrote is more about that than than the mailbox incident, so... can't remember if I said a prayer or a curse But the ground was coming at me like some mean old lady's purse I knew however much it hurt the getting up would hurt me worse But it would make me wiser if it did not kill me first Flying and falling and flying again If you're a hooping crane or a jet airplane Or just a leaf blown by the wind From the time you're brought into this world Until the day you reach the end It's all flying and falling and flying again Now the passers-by who gathered round said it didn't look too good That the fall would probably kill me And I was wishing that it would 
They all pitched in and carried me straight to intensive care. But all that I could think about was getting back up in the air. Flying and falling and flying again. If you're a hooping crane or a jet airplane or just a leaf blown by the wind. From the time you're brought into this world until the day you reach the end. It's all flying and falling and flying again. Now to chart the safest course through life is no kind of life at all. You gotta take the chance even though you might be terrified to fall. To see this planet's curvature and be sure the world is round. Just gliding for a moment is worth colliding with the ground. Flying and falling and flying again If you're a hooping crane or a jet airplane Or just a leaf blown by the wind From the time you're brought into this world Until the day you reach the end It's all flying and falling and flying again Flying and falling and flying again. That's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. It's always it's good to be back here in Lubbock. folks that's it for this episode i'd like to thank noel mckay for taking the time to visit with me you can find out more about noel at noelmckay.com if you'd like to find out more about me and this show you can visit andyhedges.com if you've been enjoying this show and you'd like to help me keep it going you could make a donation on the website or you could leave a review on the itunes store or maybe most important of all you could share it with a friend. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. <laughs>